Hi, and welcome to your weekly macro roundup, where we talk macro and try to make sense of markets that really don't make any sense. We are still a kingdom under siege. That is right, the bond sellers have not quit, but fear not. My loyal subjects, the walls of the kingdom will stay intact. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today on, of course, this rainbow shirt edition of the weekly macro show. I know some of you love this shirt and I never know what day it's coming, but here it is. So I have got some interesting news for you. We are gonna first talk about the credit data. Of course, this is the most important thing that we look at every Friday. And you know, I hope this made a lot of sense to some of you on Wednesday and based on the comments, it seemed that you, you got it, that in a debt-based economy, when you have an expansion of credit, interest rates, that's right, whoops, <laughs> that's my side, this is yours, go up. Now, it's not an instantaneous relationship. Sometimes yields will lead demand. Sometimes they follow. And it works the other way as well. So as credit contracts, interest rates have to go down. Why to spur lending growth? Now, some of you said, well, well won't rising rates spur lending growth? Well, eventually, but in the short term, they won't. I mean, think of it this way. Let's say you've got a mortgage at three and a half percent and mortgage rates go to four. Are you gonna refi? Probably not. Now, maybe down the road, you might get a different job in a different place and you'll have to sell your house and get a, uh, a mortgage at a higher rate. That's different. But in the short term, higher rates and lower rates, that's right, tighten financial conditions. I know it's bizarre, it makes no sense, but welcome to the wonderful world of the monetary system. We're also gonna take a look at the economic data uh, since Wednesday night. And what are we looking for in that and why does this matter to you? Well, we wanna find out, is the economy accelerating, decelerating, rolling over, what is going on with it? But before we get into all that, I have some big news. Now, uh, do you want the, well, I should tell you what it is. I have a massive major update on the big interview. Now, do you want the good news first or the bad news? We'll go with the bad news. The interview, which is scheduled for Monday morning, will first be hosted on Real Vision. I know, boo, boo, unsubscribe, Steve is a sellout, uh, dislike it. I said, look, uh, you want the bad news first or the good news? So here's the deal. This guest is a list, a top of the table. Big Real Vision star, and we've got him. And Real Vision offered to handle all the recording and all of the editing, because as you know, I don't edit at all. And in exchange for being on their platform first, a short while later, we get full access to it right here for free. See, there you go. All right, yes, like, get the subscribes back. Okay, good. Now that I've got you back, it's even better. I've got even better news. I have unrestricted access. The questions, I get to ask anything I want. Isn't that awesome? And here's the best part. Because as you know, I listen to what all of you have to say. I go through the comments, I read them, I try to comment, you know, I like as many of them I can, I try to comment to as many as I can. And I and also want to add that, that there are some of you that are joining in the comments, answering questions, being part of the community, and I just want to thank you and I want you to know your efforts have not gone unnoticed. I greatly appreciate you doing that. So here's the best part. I've been going through, and you didn't know this, I've been going through the comments and picking out your top questions for this person. Top, the best, the hardest ones. And see, I'm giving you a voice. See, Real Vision might get the interview first, but it's your voice they're gonna hear, your questions. So, since this thing is first thing Monday morning, and I've already got three pages of questions, and, and I'm, I'm pretty confident these are the questions we're gonna go with, but here's the deal. Here's your chance. You have a question, put it in the comments. I'm gonna go through it. I'm, and I'm not gonna say whether I like your question or not. I'll just click like, you know, I'm gonna go through the questions. I'm gonna look for it, something to replace my weakest questions. I don't know if I'm gonna get through all of them. I don't know how much time we're gonna have, but I've got the deck stacked with your best questions. And see, that's my commitment to you because you've supported me and this, yes, that's right, more likes, love it. Okay, now let's get on to the weekly uh, credit data. All right, 
and where we start with the H.8 and why we're doing that, that's right, the crown's going on. Uh, you can't see it, but it's there. All right, into the H.8. And what we can find here is we go right to secure, Treasury and Agent Securities, right to the mortgage-backed securities, which, and again, I have no explanation why the banks ran this number way up and then started to draw it down, but they added $7 billion of mortgages last week, and they added uh, just about, what, $2 billion of uh, Treasury securities. Not a lot, but it's, it's certainly based on what we've seen in the Treasury market, they don't appear to be unloading Treasury securities. But they did have, for reasons I can't explain, and I because I know all of this did not go to the Fed. Now, you know, it's it's maybe it is actually possible because the Fed's buying forty billion a month. But again, this was only in two week period. So uh, unless they're stacking these up and and paying them to the Fed on certain days, I, I don't believe that's what happens. But you know, I'm not one hundred percent sure. Let's go down to all loans and leases. Big drop off here um, by fourteen billion. How about uh, commercial industrial loans, they're down uh, 14 billion. Residential real estate up 2 billion. So again, a lot of refi action, a lot of home buying, not a lot of expansion going here in the residential real estate. And you can see this is below uh, its highs back in July of 2.299 trillion. So we're still below there. Commercial real estate loans, I tell you this, I don't know why anyone is lending in this place, and certainly the kingdom here is not, but uh, down $3 billion. But what's going on with the consumer? Because you know, it doesn't matter how much is in the consumer's goal when we look at the M2. If they're not outspending and adding on debt, it doesn't matter. Consumer loans, pretty much dead flat. Credit cards, dead flat. Automobile loans, up a billion. I mean, nothing, no, nothing really going on here in the consumer space. Let's flip over to the PowerPoints and take a look at the M2. And what we can see in the M2 is a 12 month rate of change is still rising slightly, 24.42%. The six month rate of change still very high, but at 13.23 and falling, three month rate of change is now ticked up a little higher at 2.67. Now I wanna go back and I always like to look at the M2 every week just to see kind of where money is flowing. And as we go to the end of the month, now remember, when do most people make payments on their loans? At the end of the month and the beginning, and that will show up next week. So this should be really interesting to see what happens in the M2 uh, next week. And we saw a small increase in savings deposits and on the M1, which is your demand deposits, uh, we saw pretty much flat there. And looking at institutional money funds, you see people were buying, you know, going back into risk assets as institutional money uh, went down a little bit. So not a major change in the M2. And let's go back to the charts. Now, I did find out that the Fed went to... Um, back to the monthly monetary base. It used to be monthly, and then they went to this you know, every two week thing for a while. And then they changed the data source, still every two weeks, and then they went back to monthly. So, whereas we used to go through the monetary base and the money multiplier every week, now we'll be doing it once a month because, well, it hasn't changed uh, at all. Let's take a look at real estate loans. On a year-over-year -year basis, growth rates down slightly to 3.05. Six-month rate of change is at 0 0.26. Although it's, it's rising, not by much. Look back, three-month rate of change is right, once again, pretty much right back at zero, despite record low interest rates. And what is part of the problem here is you when you have the zero or low interest rates, every time someone makes a payment on the loan, the principal value of that payment is destroyed. It's removed from the financial system. So you have all these people with low interest rates loans paying off, paying, you know, making their payments. So credit is shrinking. What you need is so much in new loans to offset that. And that's why I keep saying that low interest rates are deflationary. They can be inflationary, but in the longer term, they're deflationary because it takes a, an immense amount of new loans to offset that. And then once those new loans are done, they start entering the repayment mode, and now you need even more loans. It's the central banker's worst nightmare, and yet 
here we are still doing the same game. Uh, commercial industrial loan growth down to 16.44 from a year ago. Six month rate change is now turned negative. That's telling you that the 12 month rate of change is going to be headed to negative territory at some point. Three month rate of change is rising slightly but fairly consistent between this minus four and minus 5% range, bringing the t all loans and leases and commercial banks. The growth rates down to 5.81% from a year ago. Six month rate change is negative at about one and a half percent and the three month rate change is at minus one and slightly rising. And how about the consumer? the V-shaped recovery that everyone's looking for while well, you're not gonna find it in the credit card data. Although it went up, it's very slight to minus 9.3% from a year ago. And you can see the consumers are not running up their credit cards at all. They are staying away from that. All right, let's head back over to the economic data as soon as I figure out where we are at here. And there we go. On to the economic calendar. Let's head back to Wednesday, where we wanna be here. And we immediately get into the, the Tankin uh, surveys in Japan. Now, this is something Chris Dark and I have talked about. And Chris, I know you're listening. Uh, uh, you should better be. Uh, maybe do one of your podcasts on this, uh, on the Tankin survey. I think it's very interesting. And I also want to point out to those of you who are fans of uh, Chris Dark's podcast, uh, Dr. Dark After Dark, which I am. Uh, I listened to his interview with Raul Powell today, and it's not your typical, you know, Raul, you know, macro interview. They talked about a, a whole bunch of other subjects. I actually think it was one of Chris's top podcasts. If, he, if I had to pick one of his, I would listen to again. All right, well, maybe this couple of them that I would but this was be this would be dev I mean there's a couple great guests he's had that's some great information but this one will stand the test of time because the advice and stuff that Ralph shared and Chris, and he and Chris talked about top of the table in my book loved it thanks good job Chris uh, all right on to uh, back to the tank and survey you can see that it is improved in some areas slightly but not much. It still still tells us whatever's going on in Japan is bad news. Now, South Korea, we do get some good news. Exports are up 7.7% from a year ago. We went from negative to big swing positive. Perhaps this is some of that inventory rebuilding we're seeing uh, in the U.S. data. Imports also big swung from double digit negative to positive 1.1% from a year ago. Smashing expectations. I mean, nobody saw that come. Moving into the Thursday data, uh, what do we see here? So, so far, we're what, what are we taking away? Not much really growth coming out of Japan because this data is not very pretty. Things are better in South Korea. How about we move into Europe and we get all these manufacturing surveys and we see what Italy, 53.2, slight expansion. Uh, France, 51.2, almost no expansion. Germany, uh, 56.4, yeah, slightly above slight. Uh, expansion and we move into the broad eurozone manufacturing PMI 53.7 tells us that the manufacturing sector in the eurozone is only on a slight expansion and from last month and when we zoom in to the data if it will pull up fast enough we'll see and perhaps not I know some of you say get rid of all those ads Steve hey this is an ad supported show so uh, I do enjoy them we'll check back on that in a minute how about the producer price index on a year-over-year -year basis on the eurozone still exporting deflation at minus 2.5 percent an improvement from minus 3.1 last month but still the eurozone is exporting deflation so it looks like we're not going to get that chart today uh, moving into the U.S. data, we've got the personal consumption expenditures. The Fed's preferred gauge of inflation moved up to 1.4% uh, on a year-over-year -year basis, still far below the Fed's 2% goal. We see personal incomes uh, drop minus 2.7% in August. Again, government transfers going away. This is a problem for consumers, but personal spending was up. So we see that spending outpaced income. I'm gonna guess that's not gonna to last too much longer. And then inflation adjusted personal, uh, personal consumption rose 0.7% in August. So as I read this, I think, okay, people are spending more than they're making. You know, perhaps they're, they're dipping into their savings from the pandemic. 
probably not going to last a whole lot longer, but you never know. Moving into the market manufacturing PMI 53.2, again, slight expansion in the U.S. manufacturing sector, according to market. Uh, construction spending up 1.4%, mostly in the residential real estate. In the, in the non-residential, it's turning negative on a year-over-year basis. And looking at the official, quote-unquote, ISM manufacturing PMI 55.4, again, pretty much a solid slight expansion in the manufacturing sector. Nothing to write home about. New orders looking pretty good at 60, but employment stagnated 49.6 no change their prices are up in the manufacturing sector suggesting potential inflation only if they can move those prices if they can come out of the factories and pass them on to consumers let's move into the friday data where we get the non-farm payroll report at 661,000 new jobs created by the economy totally missing expectations of 850,000 what is good is the average hourly earnings improved to 4.7% on a year-over-year basis, but we'll see if we can get that chart up. And we also see average weekly hours moved up. So let's see if we've got the charts here. God, it's not really pulling them up. These are still below. You can look at May of 2020, where it was growing to 7.9% hourly uh, average hourly earnings versus 4.7. And this isn't terrible. It's just decelerating. And we look at weekly hours. Uh, let's see where they're, they're pretty consistent. Uh, looks like employers are, are getting a little bit more work out of their employees instead of hiring. The participation rate, so the, the number, the percentage of people participating in the workforce fell to 61.4. And due to that, the unemployment rate actually fell to 7.9. It's not how you want to see the unemployment rate fall. As we, as we move over into... The, let's see, factory orders uh, missed expectations at 0.7%, uh, which is a big slowdown for last month at 6.5. So, so far, what are we seeing in the data? A slowdown, a slowdown, a slowdown. But looking at the consumer confidence uh, from the University of Michigan, we see current conditions are up, sentiments up, ex and uh, expectations are all up. Still not close to where they were before we'll see if we can get that chart but here's one big key inflation expectations went down from 3.1 to 2.6 so anyone betting on inflation consumers aren't seeing it in five-year inflation expectations unchanged at 2.7 and i don't know what's going on here but we're not getting any charts out of that stuff let's take a look at the total construction spending against the non-farm payroll report and what we can see is it looks like the non-farm payroll report is starting to, let's make that a little bit bigger for you, it's looking like it's slowing down. So momentum, you know, some of you asked about momentum from the Sunday charts. This is momentum. See, so it's moving real fast. You know, think of it, you're accelerating off the, uh, off the line, the light turns green and you hit the gas and then you start letting off. And so we're seeing momentum start to slow here. And construction spending can help pull that up, but if construction spending rolls over or stays flat, it's not going to be good for non-farm payrolls. And how about the cash freight index? We see it shot up. The, the question that I have here, as we look at retail sales kind of rolling over, we didn't have a retail sales report this week, but is the inventory rebuild done? Is that what's going, you know, there's a big question right now. Are, is the factory sector doing what it's doing just to replace inventory? And will there be demand there? So it'll be interesting to see what goes on in the CAS freight index going forward. All right, I want to take a look at one quick chart. Since we're doing the chart show on Friday, which is great, we don't have to spend a ton of time here. But there's one thing I want to look at. That is XLE, the energy sector. And, and people are going to start to get really excited about this because it's potentially making a double bottom. It's getting close. And I said potentially. We're not there yet. I believe we will get there and perhaps even below. But if we take this and we look at what's going on in the rest of the market and we'll overlay XLE on top of itself and let's go take a look at crude oil. You know, a lot of people are really bullish on crude oil, but guess what? Energy stocks are telling you the crude oil is coming way back down. And if crude oil does, and I want you to think about this, is that inflationary or deflationary? Well, it's absolutely deflationary. And we could see there's a very tight relationship but sometimes crude oil leads energy stocks right now Ener or if we see energy stocks leading crude oil here sometimes it switches back and forth but you know you look at where energy stocks are and you're really seeing 
crude oil much, much lower. Remember, no one thinks that's possible, but this relationship says it's going to happen. The other way you can take the energy sector, because remember, if, if energy is inflationary, when there's a demand for energy, that means the economy is expanding. When there's not, that means the economy is contracting. And if we overlay that against 30-year treasury yields that everyone thinks are going higher and going to the moon, well, the energy sector is telling you quite the opposite is going to happen. So some of you wonder, how can you still be bullish? You know, when interest rates are up, um, you know, last few days, it's simple. The energy sector is telling me uh, there's, there's no inflation. You know, moving bonds is transitory. You know, another thing that Chris and Raul talked about was volatility and when to buy things and timing of it. And I know some of you sent me the short-term chart on bond volatility. I really wish I had the big, you know, you know multi-decade chart like I have with the VIX to show you. But when bond, bond volatility is low, and right now it's at, you know, near or close to its multi-decade lows, that's when you want to buy bonds. So everyone is saying like, oh no, bond prices, you know, they, they can only go down from here. Well, the bond volatility doesn't say that. See, it's, it's the opposite of equity volatility. So when you look at, say, the VIX, and let's take XLE off of here. You don't you don't want to buy stocks when the VIX is low. You want to buy them when it's high. Well, bond volatility is just the opposite. When bond volatility is low, that's when you want to buy stocks. And bond volatility, my friends, it's super low. It kind of makes it interesting for me to think that people still believe that interest rates are shooting higher. Well, this kingdom, my friends, it's pretty tight. I'll see you on Sunday for the charts. And yes, for those of you who asked, silver will be in the chart deck on Sunday. I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the comments. Be sure, give me those questions for Monday. You're going to love that interview. We're going to knock it out of the park. All right. Have a great weekend. Bye now. The content of this video is provided educational information and is not intended to provide investment or other advice. It is not to be construed as a recommendation or solicitation by a security finance or instrument or participate in any particular trading strategy. This video is prepared by Steam Van Meter. Personal capacity depends on the expression of this video that I'm on. I do not reflect the view of Atlas Financial Advisors, Inc. or Steam Van Meter Financial.